several thousand people gathered on this evening in April in central Belgrade to sing the Russian national anthem. They came to show their support for Russia and its president, Vladimir Putin. We're on the right side, on Russia's side. They chant, Serbs and Russians, brothers forever. And we don't need the EU. What does Russia mean to you? It's our brotherland. For me, it's the only country apart from Serbia where I could live. A great people, a great culture. Simply the fact that Russia exists is good news. Who is this for? For Austria. For Austria? The enemy? Why didn't you say that straight off? These demonstrations, a regular fixture since the start of the war in Ukraine, are organized by a far-right group called the People's Patrols. Their self-declared aim? To free Ukraine of Nazis. Russian brothers, in these bad times, we will accompany you on the way to the Kingdom of Heaven. Long live Serbia. Long live Russia. First and foremost, I support the Russian people. I've been thinking for a while that Putin should have intervened in Ukraine early. Russians have been dying for years. There have been atrocities in the Donbas region against the Russian people for years. That's why I support this operation. I hope it's brought to an end as quickly as possible, with the fewest possible victims, and that the denazification of Ukraine becomes reality. The Russian war of aggression against Ukraine is reinterpreted here as an act of self-defense. Russian propaganda is accepted at face value. Belgrade is the only city in Europe, besides Istanbul, still operating flights to Russia. Daria Kiseleva and Sergei Gavrilov have left Moscow for Belgrade. They've been living here for four weeks now. He's a photographer, and she worked as a food designer in the advertising industry. When the Russian economy collapsed because of sanctions and their work began to dry up, they decided to immigrate. Their debit and credit cards no longer work abroad. In Moscow, they emptied their bank accounts and exchanged their rubles for American dollars. They're now making ends meet with this money. I have no, even one minute of thinking, come back in Russia. I think uh, the way is closed. There is a um, really dangerous situation, I think, um, and we don't have some future and our children don't have some future there. The stalls in the city center are stocked up on Russian merchandise. The couple from Moscow is familiar with the nationalist symbolism from back home. In Belgrade too, they're confronted with the face of Commander-in-Chief Putin on t-shirts. The military is glorified here. A lot of people here is just supporting Russian government, supporting war, and thinking that Putin is doing great job for Slavic people. We don't think so. We are different. And the reason we are here, because we don't feel good in Russia, and we have to escape somewhere. We can say that we are Izbeglitsi, it's a Serbian word. You can translate what is it. And we are feeling better here because people are, are more friendly for Russians. And we, I can say, we are using this friendship. For as long as Putin remains in power, this couple has decided that they have to remain refugees, or Izbeglitsi, as the Serbs say. They're determined to start over here. 
Many Serbs feel so close to Russia and such a deep-rooted skepticism towards the West because of their own experiences of war. Twenty-three years ago, in spring 1999, NATO bombers attacked Serbia following the collapse of peace talks with the Serbian government. The aerial bombing was intended to stop the displacement and the murder of Kosovo Albanians by Serbian troops in what was then the province of Kosovo. Aleksa Gerbovic was just four when bombs fell on Belgrade. The events have been seared into his memory. This is what the cellars looked like where we sheltered from the NATO air raids. No one knew what to do. We didn't know whether there would be an airstrike or not. If a bomb hits the building, will it collapse into the cellar? How will we survive that? There were a lot of questions. We just said, we'll hide. In a moment like that, instinct triumphs over logic. The cellars were full. I recall that everyone who lived in the apartment block was inside, as well as people from other blocks who didn't have cellars. It was crowded. People spent hours sitting on the floor. At first, Alexa and his family fled to the cellar every time the air raid siren sounded. Days or weeks into the bombing campaign, they just stayed put in their apartment. Alexa's parents still live there. His father was in Ukraine for work at the time of the bombing raids. The rest of the family in Belgrade. It became clear to us that the bombing would go on for a long time. We couldn't spend the whole spring in the cellar. There were people who did that. But I had to try to lead a normal life. With small children, there was no question of staying there in the cellar. The NATO bombs struck strategic military targets. But as the campaign went on, civilian infrastructure also entered the firing line. The Chinese embassy in Belgrade was hit on the night of May 7, 1999, immediately followed by the Hotel Yugoslavia. Alex's family lived in a block right between these two buildings. It's just around the corner. Our windows look out onto the Chinese embassy. When it was hit, I was home alone with my young children. So we fled to our neighbors. Their apartment looks onto the Hotel Yugoslavia, which was then struck by a bomb too. All on the same evening. In our neighbor's apartment, we all sheltered under the dining table to shield ourselves from flying glass. We had no idea where to go. In the end, we just hid under the table. That is my first ever memory. The fear, the tension, the bombs, the sirens. And if I remember rightly, a powerful earthquake. The shockwave shattered the windows. The smell of fire, the fire engines, I wouldn't wish that on anyone. <laughs> After that night, they left Serbia and joined Alex's father in Ukraine, in safety. There, where bombs are now raining down. History is repeating itself. It's awful. The NATO intervention lasted 78 days. You can still see some signs of it in Serbia today. It's impossible to overlook the ruins of the former Yugoslav Defense Ministry in Belgrade. A hundred meters from Alex's apartment, behind Hotel Yugoslavia, the damage caused by the bomb strike is less obvious. 
There were three holes right through all three stories where the bombs dropped and then exploded down below. Resentment towards NATO remains strong. It's regarded as the aggressor whose bombing campaign led to the loss of Kosovo. What would you think of someone who's bombed your home? I don't think that it was a good move. An organization that propagates freedom, democracy and peace, an organization that is meant to protect people, can hardly justify its bombing of civilian areas. I condemn NATO in the way that the average Ukrainian condemns Russia. You just create hate that lasts much longer than it takes to rebuild the ruins. The scars of war are also very visible on the headquarters of the Serbian state broadcaster. Journalist Nino Brajovic used to work here. Nowadays, he's the chairman of UNS, the Journalists' Association of Serbia, which stands up for the rights of journalists. A plaque lists the names of 16 employees who died in the bombing raid 23 years ago. And the word? Why? Serbian TV did perhaps broadcast propaganda, but it also showed the victims of NATO bombings, dead civilians, not military targets. In the end, the TV building itself was attacked. This practice has been employed in other international conflicts. TV stations are subjected to targeted attacks. During the wars on Serbian territory, Russia was always a loyal ally. And so, trust has grown in the country's big brother. Liliana and Savo Lekovic flick through the foreign news channels on their television. They see the Russian news as the most reliable source of information. They learned Russian at school. While the European Union has banned the Russian state broadcaster RT, formerly known as Russia Today, you can still watch it in Serbia. Why should it be banned? To be well informed, you need to hear both sides. Even our children in the US can watch Russian channels like RT. It's only Western Europe that's taking action against them. I don't understand it. Western media show the civilian victims of the Russian bombing, while Russian TV shows those killed by Ukrainian troops. It's a battle to win hearts and minds, to create the dominant narrative about the war. 20 years ago, I saw how the war in Yugoslavia was being reported on from abroad. The overwhelming majority of TV reports consisted of lies. Pictures were put in the wrong context. It was unimaginable. Back then, I completely lost my trust in Western media. Maybe it's just my personal opinion. But I trust Russian media more because they report more objectively and honestly. Russia has already won over their hearts and minds. And the advocates of free speech in Serbia don't think outlawing Russian channels is the right solution. The Journalists' Association don't want RT banned here. It's a human right to have free media. Banning media infringes on human rights. A ban is only appropriate if media support terrorism, incite hatred or violate the constitution. In a case like that, media can also be banned in democratic states. In public space, symbols of close ties between Serbia and Russia are very prominent. 
with a clear pro-Russia election campaign, incumbent Serbian President Aleksandar Vucic was re-elected in April. Juk Velebit is a political analyst and writer. He says that the only candidate who would have won more votes than the Serbian president is Vladimir Putin himself. Skepticism towards the EU is greater than at any time since the breakup of Yugoslavia. According to the latest polls, the majority of Serbs no longer want to join. In the last 10 years, uh, we could see the glorification of Vladimir Putin, glorification of everything that Russia does. Uh, so I think that this is just the result of that. And this, is, uh, and this makes a situation very difficult for Serbian authorities and for Serbian President Vucic, who even if he would like to make a swift from the Russia to the West, it's going to be very difficult for him because he created those narratives and he created that public which is strongly supporting Russia. So I think that is uh, something that could not be changed overnight. Sretin Miovic has clearly been influenced by this climate of opinion. By profession, he's a production manager in film and TV. But when he's between jobs, he works here to make ends meet. One look at his helmet tells you what he feels for Russia. I'll tell you straight. I support the right of the Russian people to fight for their freedom. I have no problem with telling you that up front. I honestly think that this is a battle between Christ and the Antichrist. Ukraine is the Antichrist. People say they're neo-Nazis, but they're Antichrists, even if they wear crosses. He says that he's come to this conclusion because he's seen a lot of videos of Ukrainian atrocities on his phone. If you shoot someone lying wounded on the ground in the legs and mistreat them, then you can't be a Christian. A Christian would never do that. A Christian would tie their legs together and take them prisoner. But they are mistreating people. Have you also seen the crimes committed by Russians in Ukraine? No, I haven't. But it's possible that they exist. I've also been to war. I know that a few people on our side did terrible things. In the wars during the breakup of Yugoslavia in the 1990s, he volunteered to fight in Bosnia and Kosovo. The idea of uniting all Serbs in one state was one which Serbs were willing to use force to implement. But the plan failed. The Bosnian Serbs live today within the Bosnian state, and Kosovo has declared independence. Sretin values the fact that Russia has refused to recognize the independence of the breakaway province of Kosovo, and his enthusiasm for Russia is matched by his distaste for the West. People speak about freedom, about people having the right to live the way that they want. And then the Russians are suddenly cast as villains that have to be expelled. They're thrown out of theaters, radio stations and galleries, and their monuments are removed. What's that about? It's hypocritical. His love for Russia was instilled in him from an early age. My mother and father brought me up to love Russia, but on a healthy basis, not blindly. I love Russian literature, art, and Russian heroism. Russians have died in battle for us Serbs since the 19th century. They came to fight with the Serbs in the liberation from Turkish rule, and so on. God save Putin. Then there will be peace on earth. That's my opinion. Maybe I'm also mistaken. Mm -hmm.
Singing a Russian Cossack song, Sretin Miovic is driving home for the weekend to get ready for the game with his favorite soccer club, Red Star Belgrade. I'll go get my soccer things out. What does this jersey mean to you? The jersey is like an oath for me. An oath, but I'd never put my club before my nation. The nation comes first, and then the club. That's how it is for me. So Serbia comes first, and then Red Star Belgrade? No, no. Russia is in first place, then Serbia, and then Red Star Belgrade. That's the order of things for me. It will always be like that in my house. Why is Russia in first place? Because Russia is the mother. The eastern Serbian city of Zayachad has been home to Andriy Ivanov since the start of the war in Ukraine. He fled here from Lviv in western Ukraine. His grandma and his sister live in Zayachad. Shortly before the Russian invasion, the 30-year-old was warned that Ukrainian men would soon no longer be allowed to cross the border. He managed to leave Ukraine and continues to work as a graphic designer, a job he can do from home. In just 11 weeks, he's learned to speak Serbian fluently and feels settled here. A lot of people I meet here, they are like, uh, they stand for Russia, they are in friendship with Russia, and I know what is the historical background of this friendship. So, uh, but I don't find it a problem for myself, because I cannot tell what other people, what they should love or the, what they should, and they are free people here, they can, they can uh, decide their friends no matter what, so it's not a problem for me at all. A local journalist, who is also the wife of Andriy's sister, wrote an article about him fleeing to Serbia. Hey, zdravo. Hey, Milko Stojanovic works for the independent newspaper Danas, which is critical of the government. After the story was published, things turned ugly. The family faced a barrage of insults. You support NATO and you are a Nazi, one person writes here. The article caused a storm on social media. Shortly after the article was published in Danas, myself, my wife and Andri were insulted. People called us Nazis and Azov sympathizers and accused us of hushing up the Russian victims and spreading misinformation about supposed Ukrainian war victims. The journalist knows some of the comment writers personally. His neighbors are among them. Milko Stojanovic is a sports teacher by training, but he was refused employment because he was told he had the wrong political views. He set up an office in his parents' home and has been writing about local social and political topics for the last four years. A social media storm like the one unleashed by the story about Andri is a new experience for him. The war in Ukraine has polarized people. There is quite a bit of propaganda, such as in the magazine Informa. The front page headline was, Ukraine attacks Russia, or newspapers like Allo or Republika. I can't believe my eyes when I read them. No wonder that my article got the reaction that it did when I consider what kind of country I'm living in. Here in Brussels, the Russian-friendly tendencies in Serbia are being viewed with suspicion. Serbia has been an official candidate for EU membership since 2012. This expert from one Brussels think tank says you can't have it both ways. 
It's quite clear that at one point in time, Serbia has to decide. Either it's going to wholeheartedly commit itself to the European Union accession and support the European Union in all uh, issues, particularly now with regard to the sanctions against uh, Russia, which Serbia does not want to join, uh, or it goes another way. Uh, and uh, so this is a, a clear a decision that Serbia has to take, and obviously, since it started the accession negotiations, we expect them to, to follow that logically to its conclusion. In April, the Serbian president had a symbolic message for the country's European partners. With great pomp and ceremony, he presented the military's newly acquired and modernized equipment. It included lots of aviation hardware from Russia, modernized MiG-29 jets from old Russian and Belarusian stocks, as well as Russian helicopters. The new air defense system comes from China. It's based on the Russian S-300 system. It is more or less a copy, but cheaper. The U.S. had warned Serbia against making the purchase. Pressure from embassies from the West or the East doesn't interest me. Americans, Russians, or Europeans, all the rest don't matter to me. My decisions are made purely in the interest of the Serbian Republic, even if I'm alone in the world. I've been elected, and over the next five years, I will take decisions to benefit the Serbian people. Long live Serbia. Security analyst Aleksandar Radic says that the government's symbolic gesture is a denial of political realities. Serbia is a member of NATO's Partnership for Peace program, to the dismay of the majority of Serbs. Serbia has two faces. One is for a domestic audience. The media shows Russian weapons so that the pro-Russian element, which dominates public opinion, gets the impression that the purchase of Russian weapons is a priority for the Serbian defense. But in reality, the majority of weapons come from Western states and are NATO-oriented. In the long term, the Serbian defense industry is aiming to cooperate with the West. All the components of Serbian weapon systems come from the West. Russia has long been the big brother who has stood by Serbia. And here, war criminals like former Bosnian Serb military leader Ratko Mladic are revered as heroes. Since the invasion of Ukraine, a new mural has been created. It's already been defaced and restored on a number of occasions. <laughs>